All right, well, welcome to episode 29 of the Hunt Back Country podcast here on the line with Steve already. Steve, we're talking to one of the, uh, what I consider, fellow Idaho guys up there that just flats out gets it done. Um, excited to hear what Travis Nowotny has to say in this episode. What uh, What's the story with Travis? You know him better than I, for sure. Uh, yeah, he's just a local guy that uh, I had probably met four or five years ago. I think he lives just outside of Boise here, and Travis is just a straight-up killer. I don't know what else to say other than he goes out and just year after year after year gets it done consistently on just public land. Doesn't matter. He's kind of a um, – he just loves so much – loves hunting so much that he'll just go out there whether it's rifle season or bow season or muzzleloader season um and he'll just buy a tag and like every weekend i swear he comes home with an animal it's, it's incredible so yeah i'm excited sure. to get him on and just just learn from him you know that's what this uh podcast is all about is us becoming better hunters and and he's definitely uh, a guy that's going to have a lot of good information and tips for just about anybody looking to be more successful yeah so i know he's one of those guys he's an exo user and one of the guys that we really love to see as an exo user basically because yeah. he hunts so stinking hard like he really puts the pack to the test yeah and so he it's does. really cool um he's already using a brand new product that just released so we want to take just a couple minutes here front just to give the scoop and a little bit of info about it um if you want more pictures and details you can of course head to the exo mount gear website or even Travis has already given us some awesome photos of his uh, shed hunting pursuits if you hit up the Hunt Backcountry Instagram page. But, Steve, what is this new product? Uh, yeah, so it's called our 1500 HH for Horn Hauler. Um, you know, it was it was like a year and a half ago. I think, I don't know, Lenny and I were just driving, and we were, I was just like, man, we need to build a, an accessory to attach to our frame just specifically for shed hunting. Uh you know, it's just such um, become a popular thing nowadays. And, you know, you can strap sheds to the, the frame as it is or to the bag and kind of make it work. But I thought that, you know, you should be able to do something that really, you know, horns are frankly a pain in the ass to, to strap to the pack. I mean, they're yeah, just awkward. bulky and awkward and clumsy. And um, so really it came down to just kind of figuring out what was the best design for that. And that was basically a bat wing style, you know, design where you've got side pockets that kind of close and wrap around the horns. Uh, and then adding extra compression straps. Um, and so basically we've got two identical pockets, a, a right and a left version. Um, and, you know, and we built them really simple, uh, but also they can do a lot, you know, that we built it with the, the zipper is kind of exposed on the outside. So even when the pack's all compressed up, you can open that up without having to undo compression straps. You know, we're trying to think about, you've got this awkward little horns and you're trying to get food out of the bag last thing you want to do is have to undo these all these compression straps and have your horns falling all over the place so right. we built the zipper on the outside uh, you'll see if you jump on the website and look at the pictures you can see that they're kind of on the outside seam and that way it gets you quick access to it uh, to inside the bag inside the bag we have a water bladder pouch and also a strip for our, our velcro stash pocket uh, and then on the outside of the wings we've got like a lower a pocket that's got elastic kind of sewn at the top so it kind of collapses when it's not in use it's similar to the side pockets on the 3500 and 5500 yeah um and then a bungee cord system on top of that because we we kind of built the whole thing and like man if you were just going out for the day where are you going to put your jacket and you know kind of those bulky extra things and so we just did this bungee cord system and that way you can stuff your jacket in there real quick and um pretty much for day shed hunting it's it's a really slick setup and if you're going to overnight with it uh, you know, I'll go on a backpacking trip. If you just had a dry bag that you threw your, you know, your sleeping bag and pad and some of your camp gear in, it would be pretty much a super light, awesome little setup. So, yeah. Uh, on top of that, we came up with two, uh, two ideas for compression straps. Um, and so the the system is is 149 bucks, um, and it comes with four extra compression straps. Two that were once people get this and start using it, they're going to really realize how cool it is. But uh, it's basically a, an eight-inch piece of heavy-duty um, kind of rubberized elastic that's sewn to two pieces of webbing. And that way, you can really bundle the horns up nice and tight together. And as the horns shift and move, that elastic's going to keep tension on it. Oh, and that was perfect. kind of the whole thought behind it of, you know, a regular strap. You know, those horns, just like you can keep tightening them and they're going to keep shifting and moving around. So this elastic, um, I guess bungee cord would be a, a more appropriate term for it. But it's just going to expand and contract and, and allow it to allow the horns not to be rattling and moving around. 
And then we built two extra straps called, we just call them our G hook straps and they hook right into where your meat shelf hooks in. Uh, and then it's just a long piece of webbing with a buckle on each end. And so you can kind of loop that around, kind of go around the brow tines and it clips back up and in, and that'll give you kind of that solid bottom. That's super easy to play with. As far as once you start stacking horns on there, you can kind of weave it in and out and clip it back in. So together with the wings and the four compression straps, it's a pretty slick setup for packing horns. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Sorry, that was the the long-winded version of it, but it's kind of a a simple product that that can really do a lot. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's up on the site now. There's some good pictures. I know we'll have a video coming as well, Um, you know, so look for that to come. As always, if you want to kind of stay up to date and really get the latest information, just go over to exomountaingear.com forward slash newsletter. Um, we don't send out, you know, a bunch of junk email, but when there's something new and cool like this, we'll certainly let you guys know about it. So if you're interested in that, check it out. But for now, on to the show with Travis. Hope you guys enjoy this one. Well, Travis, welcome to the Hunt Back Country podcast. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. It's great to be here. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. Steve, how you doing, bud? Uh, doing really well. Just uh, weather's warming up and feels good. You know, get out on the mountain bike a little bit more, start shooting the bow some more. That uh, September itch is getting pretty strong. Yeah. Have you, you haven't got your trad bow from south, have you? No. No. Okay. I talked to him the other day. We're probably still a month out from that. So okay. I don't even plan to hunt with it this fall i'm just gonna start shooting and yeah and just kind of get used to it you say that now but we'll see how it goes <laughs> yeah <laughs> have you shot trad at all travis yeah a little bit have you? i've got a uh, nabbit longbow and yeah I, I shoot it quite a bit i'm gonna yeah. try and kill a bear this spring with it so oh nice huh? have you taken any critters at all uh, i've killed a couple white tailed does with it and yeah. a javelina so oh nice did you go down to like texas or something or arizona Arizona. Yeah. That's very cool. That's on my list, man. I want to do that. It sounds so fun. Oh, it's a kick. Those little stink pigs. Yeah, they they stink. That's for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's cool. Well, just to to get the ball rolling and kind of get to know you, um, you know, they kind of have a new project going on with Skyline Hunting. What can you tell us about that? I know you got the website rolling, but what's kind of the idea behind that project and where do you see it going and how did it get started? Really, it's just uh, Rick Palmer and I, he's, a, he's my hunting buddy, we're, you know, we just kind of wanted to go do something and, and try it and see where it goes. Basically, our plan is just to, you know, we're going to run a blog and we're going to have a photo journal on there. So throughout the year, we're going to try and do our best and bring the hunt to you as it happens. So you know, we go spring bear hunting. We're going to try and take a lot of pictures and just put it on our blog and, you know, kind of just have fun with it and see where it goes. Yeah. I know that, I mean, in the past, just looking at even like your personal, you know, Instagram feed and like that, you guys certainly have a ton of awesome content. So it's probably cool to have that place to really kind of promote it. Do you have any, uh, obviously you mentioned bear hunting from the spring, any big plans you're shooting for this fall tags you're trying to draw? Yeah. So I plan on putting in for, uh, Idaho sheep and um, I'll put in for Oregon sheep and I'm just going to try and do all the usual hunts that I do uh, any kind of over-the-counter hunt that I can get my hands on you know I'm all for so yeah how many tags do you did you have in your pocket last year because I mean you killed 10 big game animals I don't know just uh, <laughs> <laughs> honestly I mean I filled all my tags that's <laughs> that's all I, <laughs> yeah, know, I know I guess <laughs> No, it was a good year. So I, it's yeah, a good yeah, problem when you fill all your tags and you have no idea how many tags you even had. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I don't know. It's just a lot of animals that I killed. Yeah, yeah I just have fun with it. So, <laughs> Well, clearly, I mean, I'm I'm going out of that limb here, but you got to be single, right? <laughs> I'm married. I got, Are you really? Yeah, I got a nine-month-year-old baby. and Wow. You know, yeah, I've got a very supportive wife. So That's awesome, man. Uh, it is. Cool. So, let, you know, I want to talk about a few things tonight. You know, already here, you do a ton of hunting, all kinds of species, all kinds of critters. Um, You mentioned your hunting partner, but we also want to talk about some solo aspects tonight. Um, And to, to transition to that, tell us about your 
um, Utah mule deer hunt from last year. It was a solo hunt and turned out great. If we could just kind of begin to hear that story and maybe some of the lessons you learned or tactics that proved valuable in that, if we could just kind of dive into it, I think it'd be awesome to hear. You know, really in a whole, it was, you know, I hunted Utah last year and it, I didn't end up punching my tag. I, I got on some good bucks and just couldn't make it happen. So this year I was kind of gung ho and I just, it was a goal to be successful. So I went down there and, you know, I, I backpacked in about seven miles and I was pretty familiar with the area hunting it the year before. And, you know, my, my plan, I, I don't necessarily want to go all the way down there to shoot, um, a buck I'm not happy with. And, you know, I'm, I'm a trophy hunter, but when it comes down to it, I'm just a hunter. I, it's all about having fun to me, but the first, oh, four days, I, I didn't even find a shooter buck. So it was, uh, pretty frustrating, but when I finally did find a buck, um, he bedded in an awesome spot and, you know, I waited for midday to hit and the thermals to turn uphill and I tore off after the buck and, you know, long story short, I got executed a perfect shot or perfect stock and got right in on the buck and, uh, you know, I just missed and what was the range on that shot? It was 47 yards and that was with the downhill angle. Okay. You know, and that was compensated. Yeah, exactly. And when I, I'd, I would shoot a slider and for whatever reason, um, my 50 yard pin was a touch high, but everything else was perfect. And then when I dialed, you know, I've got four pins, 20 through 50, um, everything else was perfect. Like my 60, 70, you know, it was dead nuts, but when I ranged that buck at 47 yards, that was the exact time that he stood up from his bed. And I just, I didn't have time to think about it, run it through my head, you know? So mm-hmm. I drew back and I s- thought I settled low and I used my 50 yard pin, but you know, that combination of me shooting high already at 50 yards and, uh, just not burning that pin low. I just shot right over his back and it, you know, it, it really crushed me because it's a lot of work than backcountry hunts like that solo and everything. Yeah. And you're already on what the, the fifth day you said at that point, fourth, fifth yeah, day. That, so. that was day five. And it was actually, I went one day early just to scout and get my eyes on everything. And that was the day I had to basically leave all week that I executed a perfect stock and I didn't follow through with a shot, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, long story short, again, it's Friday night after work. I, hop in my pickup all my stuff was ready i hauled butt down to utah a six hour drive and uh anyway i was just so tired i couldn't even make it to the trailhead i was i was probably five miles from the trailhead and i was too tired to drive the extra five miles so i just <laughs> pulled off the side of the road <laughs> you put my seat back and yeah. set my alarm on my phone for four o'clock and anyway i my alarm went off i woke up and I went in there and at daylight, like sun's coming up, I was, I had to pull another big ridge to get in the pocket that I wanted to hunt, but I just stopped and was doing a little glass and I spotted a, an awesome buck, a shooter buck. And anyway, uh, that buck was just feeding with two other bucks on that hillside and he was right near some real thick timber and I didn't want to take a chance at losing the buck because I knew he was going to bed in that thick timber and I wouldn't be able to make a stock. So I just tore off after him as soon as I, you know, I got my pack back on and everything. And I got within like 150 yards of where they were. I last saw the bucks at and, uh, I just kind of walking along and I'm glassing and I can't find the bucks anywhere. I'm like, man, they've, they had to have moved into this little cut. So I'm just kind of sneaking through these, uh, jack pines, just these short pine trees. And I'm just tiptoeing through there and I catch some antler tips just over the ridge, you know, about 50 yards. Just with your naked eye or you were glassing with binos or? I was glassing and kind of picking everything apart, but I just stumbled right just as the curve of the hill 
you know, oh, let everything gotcha. exposed everything. I, I saw this buck's antler tips just feeding there like 50 yards away and they were in the shade and it was at this time it was, eh, it's probably eight thirty in the morning, something like that. But, uh, I just kept creeping along, going real slow until there was one jack pine right in front of me. And the buck I wanted to shoot was broadside right behind this skinny jack pine. I mean, I could have shot him in the front shoulder and I could have shot him in the hind quarter. He was just, his vitals were just completely covered. So as he started the feet uphill, I drew my bow back and I'm standing in this, the shade of this dugout deer bed. And I come to full draw, and he's like 35 yards at this point. And I'm just, I'm expecting to hammer him. As soon as he steps and lets his vitals come out, I was just going to let that arrow rip. And the buck picks his head up and turns and starts trotting right towards me. Oh. I'm just on a beeline. I'm sitting there, <laughs> and this buck's coming, I mean, right to me. And this thing, finally, he, at about eight yards, I had to shoot him right through the front shoulder, like right in front of his shoulder. And it, exited out perfect right behind his lungs and he turned around and went out of sight and as soon as he went out of sight i saw this dust come out of that canyon and i i knew he was mine and i was just so pumped from yeah all, all that work i'd put in the trip before and it's wow it's just just funny how bow hunting sometimes it just comes to that once you know you, you can hunt so hard and feel like you're so far from making it happen and it just takes that one split second opportunity that you know, results in punching a tag. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's, that's a great point because you weren't even, you weren't even in that spot you were trying to get to. You just kind of happened to stop in glass there at daylight and it all led to all of this coming together, really. You know, sometimes it's those things you least expect. Oh, exactly. And that's, you know, that's a great thing about bow hunting. It's just, it's the unexpected, really. Yeah. I think that's a, kind of a key element to two guys like you Travis that are consistently successful is you you find a way to I don't know I guess in the past I've, I'm always guilty of I don't know just blowing an opportunity like that or maybe I was trying to get from A to B and just put my head down and, and hiked right past an opportunity you know and I think guys like you and Arrest Meyer just seem to capitalize um, consistently on those yeah I would you know, I would have to agree. I've, I've played it through my head a million times and I, I just can't understand it in the, you know, cause I see, I know there's a lot of other hunters out there that hunt just as hard, if not harder than me. But I think is what it boils down to is just, you know, I always stay positive and it, I think a lot of it has to do with it. It's, you know, hunting is just my life. It's what I think about all the time. So even when I'm I mean, even even when I'm down, you know, you just kind of got to keep a positive attitude and and really just give it all you got. And it it for me, it always has seemed to come together. I've I've learned over the years that if I stay positive, I stay confident, I keep my head up and I work hard for that opportunity. I'm going to get that opportunity. I might not capitalize on that opportunity, but, you know, that's opportunity is is all a guy can really hope for so yeah would you classify yourself um as is very focused out there sun up to sundown or do you kind of take an hour or two or are you just kind of relaxing and, and enjoying it or is it is it very serious um <laughs> that's a good question you know <laughs> i do notice when i hunt by myself i'm very very focused like mm -hmm. i hunt all day i'm glassing all day i mean not necessarily all day. I mean, I think we're all guilty of taking a nap in the middle of the day when you're, you get up <laughs> way before yeah, yeah. dark and you're just beat. I mean, you got to take those, those little cat naps on the hillside, but you know, for the most part, I'm, I'm pretty much all business. And, uh, when Rick and I hunt together, we sure have a good time, but you know, we're still, we're still pretty focused. Yeah. yeah still getting it done. So going into the solo topics, I mean, I think, you know, more than gear, more than tactics, a lot of the stuff that people talk about, I think the biggest factor in solo hunting is what we've already started to talk about, and that's mindset. Um, and so before we get into the, the, the persistence mindset of hunting, let's back all the way up. I mean, you mentioned you're, you're driving to Utah, you're going seven miles in, you're spending, you know, four or five, however many days you can in there back alone. 
is that something that at least in the beginning you struggled with in terms of just the mindset of, you know, being out of state, being away from family, uh, being away from civilization period, and just being in the back country by yourself. And how did you sort of develop the mindset to be comfortable with that? Oh, uh, absolutely. When, you know, when I was younger, I was, I was honestly, I was scared to death to go by myself, but you know, as I got older and I got my driver's license and I kind of got more independent, um, I couldn't get people to go with me all the time. I couldn't always get my buddies to go and I couldn't get my family to go or, you know, whatever different schedules, but I always had that burning desire to be out there and do it. So I just, the more and more I did it, the more and more I got out in the field, the more I hunted, the more comfortable I became. And now it's to the point, you know, I almost prefer to hunt alone just, just because, you know, you can be at one with, with nature and, you know, you control every aspect of the hunt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to ask that question earlier, if, if you prefer to hunt solo or, or with Rick. Um, um I, yeah. You know, when I hunt mule deer, I really like to be by myself. Um, yeah. It just so happens that, you know, we scout together and we put a lot of time in together. So we help each other and it, you know, Rick and I are a really good combination. He is very, he is very gung ho and, you know, it helps drive me. And I, you know, I, I obviously help drive him because we, we've talked about it a lot and, you know, we, we just have a good combination that seems to work really well together. So. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really lucky to have that. A lot of guys I talk to are always looking for a good hunting partner and they're not easy to come by. No, they're not. <laughs> so in terms of hunting solo versus hunting with a partner, you know, when you're with a partner, I think there's a shared motivation there that, you know, you're in it together. You both want to make it happen. You're there to encourage each other. And at the same time, you have like an accountability factor in that you don't want to let your partner down. Do you find it's more difficult when you're solo to stay as motivated to be out there to hunt just as hard and things like that? I mean, you already mentioned that, you know, now you know that if you just be persistent, you'll get those opportunities. But in what ways have you sort of realized hunting solo is different from a motivation perspective than hunting with a partner? You know, um, I wouldn't say that, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's not different? <laughs> no, it's definitely different. Like having the camaraderie of someone and someone with the same mindset, you know, on day three when, you know, maybe the tables aren't turned your way, to have someone motivate you and, and help push towards a common goal, I think that you know, that really helps, but uh, anyway, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> no, you're good. I mean, I'm just thinking like, you know, going back to that Utah hunt, for example, on day four, you haven't even spotted a shooter buck. Or is it even in your yeah. mind at that point where you're like, what am I doing? They're not here. You know, I just think it's different being solo and facing those circumstances versus, you know, having a partner. Yeah, there's definitely more downtime. You get to think about those things more. Like, I find myself... Like, more in your you head, know, yeah. Exactly. You know, thinking back, you know, I can't find any bucks right now. I should I should probably be at home spending time with my family. You know, what's my wife doing? You know, that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. I always go back to, a guy's only got so much time. And it's I always tell myself, you know, I've, I've looked forward to this all year and I've got, you know, maybe a three day weekend here and oh, the next week, you've only got so many weekends, you know, and that, that time that you're there, you've got to be focused and you've got to make the most of them. So, you know, even if it's just going through the motions and staying, you know, positive and confident, I mean, you don't necessarily have to be grinding in, you know, grinding in and out every day, to, you know, yeah. sometimes it's just best just to, to be out there and just, and, uh, you know, you can't kill a buck from the couch pretty much. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> so you mentioned, you know, wondering what your wife's up to and things like that. And obviously being away from the family, do you use any sort of like spot or delorm or any sort of messenger to make sure that you can stay in contact when you're on a solo trip in the back country? No, <laughs> I'm pretty bad about that. You know, I, 
I've thought about getting a Delorme, you know, especially when my wife is pregnant. I, it worried me all the time, but you know, no, not for me. I, I, I just, you know, most of the time you don't have cell phone service and that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. Cool. So let's, um, you know, just I guess while we're on that point, um, you know, if you're not using that. You're probably not carrying these, but I was wondering more about from a gear perspective, do you do anything different when you're solo versus with a partner in terms of, you know, safety items or just in case items, you know, if you're out there truly alone for five, six days, does your gear look different than if you're doing a trip with a buddy? No, not typically. Um, the only difference I would say is, you know, sometimes if I'm with a buddy, you know, we'll, one guy will pack a fuel canister for my jet boil and we'll split up a two person tent, you know, and kind of try to lighten things up that way. But yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Just sharing the load. Mm hmm. Exactly. So Travis, you're, you're obviously very successful out there and, and consistently successful. And a, and a lot of that probably, you know, you could trace back to the work that you're doing prior to season. So what are, you know, what's kind of your typical year look like as far as, you know, do you scouting maps, using Google Earth, actually getting in the field? I know you, we've talked in the past, I mean, you get out there in, in May and June as soon as you can and start kind of hunting around, looking for spots and looking for sign and things like that. So what's, what are kind of that early, early season scouting stuff that you're doing? You know, usually towards the end of June, I'm just so, <laughs> I'm, I'm antsy to get out there. So I've got, Usually I make a checklist of areas that I want to check. And a lot of that that I'm doing like late June is learning roads, um, looking at maps, Google Earthing, you know, trying to figure out how to get in certain places that I want to check out so that, you know, come 4th of July when scouting is, you know, that's prime time for mule deer, um, you're, there's no wasted time, so... Yeah, you're not learning anything on the fly there. You've kind of got it rocking and rolling. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then, you know, I, I try to hit all the spots that I've learned over the years hold, you know, good numbers. And I just continually checking different areas just to see quality. You know, I don't necessarily hunt the same spot every year. It might be every three years that I get back to one of those spots just because there might not be quality in you know, this isn't Utah or <laughs> or something like that. This is mm -hmm. Idaho general season. It gets it gets hammered. It gets hunted from you know September first clear till December in some of these hunts. So yeah. So what uh, when you're going in in June? Are there, is there anything you're kind of in particular looking for? Uh, you know, if the if the deer aren't necessarily there yet. Uh, it really depends if I'm I'm scouting like high country or desert you know a lot okay. of the desert country you know the deer are where they're going to be but mm -hmm. you know in the high country a lot of those deer they don't show up to those high country basins till mid-july um so you know the main thing late june is just getting my eyes on deer that i think are good up i mean you can tell if a buck's going to be a good buck um late june and the biggest thing is just getting out and and uh, getting out there and learning the roads and that kind of thing just mm -hmm. saves time when it comes crunch time. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that's a great point of, you know, in the same way that you want to have a game plan in going to opening day for your hunt, you're basically saying you want to have a game plan in going to quote unquote opening day or, you know, early July for your scouting too. So you're not wandering around and figuring things out at that point. Exactly. Yeah. How you, does that, you know, I would, don't go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, I always thought it was key. Scouting is, is very important and it's, it's something that's really helped me be successful because, you know, come opening day, I know where I'm going. I know what those animals are doing. I'm not, you know, I, I think if you want to be a serious, successful hunter, um, you can't go into opening day trying to figure out where the animals are. You have to know where they are so that 
come opening day, you're hunting those animals. You're not hunting for those animals. So how does your scouting game plan work for out-of-state hunts? Um, you mentioned specifically, you know, your Utah buck from this year. You had hunted the year previous, so you're familiar with the area. But going back to maybe the first year that you hunted Utah, um, how does your scouting work then? Do you try and make preseason trips? And even for those preseason trips, how are you identifying areas um, when you're new to the state or new to an area of that state? Um, you know, first of all, the first thing I did when I picked an area, I just, I just Google earth. I was messing around on Google earth and I just kind of looked at some of the different country that I look similar to Idaho where I find deer. And, uh, I just planned a couple scouting trips. I went down there twice and, you know, I was happy with, there was plenty of deer. So I knew if I could get in there opening day I should be able to find something to hunt you know and then I mean when you, you when you're comparing those lands in Google Earth obviously you're looking at things like access and things of that nature is it hard to translate that in other states when you're sort of going in blind and you don't know exactly what that looks like and how to anticipate crowds or have you found that you know once you find those areas and sort of judge the access, I mean, that's what that preseason scouting trip is really for is to kind of determine, all right, what kind of pressure and things do you anticipate in that area? Yeah, the, (laughs) you know, I don't necessarily look at, you know, how easily accessible it is, I guess, when I'm hunting out of state. Like I just went there and, I didn't really take any of that into consideration. I just basically looked where I thought there was deer and I went there and turns out there was a ton of hunters, you know, I thought that, you know, when I was scouting, I didn't see anybody and being that far back there, I thought that there might be a couple guys that go in there, but opening day, there were, there were five other bow hunters, you know, all in that same country that I was hunting and it, you know, it, it really weighed on me, you yeah. know, here in Idaho, <laughs> yeah. you don't, you don't run into that kind of thing. You know, you might run into a bow hunter or something like that. And, but, you know, you kind of just got to, you know, adapt and just that kind of thing. But, but did your strategy change on that hunt with five other guys there? Or were you, you know, probably more on the ball of making sure you're absolutely where you need to be first light and, or, or did you, anticipate maybe them pushing animals and and hunting somewhere else or no i pretty much um after that first day i just went deeper i went to a nasty (laughs) little canyon that i didn't think anybody would get to and i got away from the people so okay and still found deer (laughs) i did find deer you know utah (laughs) utah is pretty incredible there's there's a lot of deer you know compared to what I'm used to here in Idaho anyway, and some, some dang good ones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's your tag strategy like for Utah as a, a non-resident? What does that look like in terms of how often you get to hunt there and how difficult it is to get a tag? Um, well, I'm mean, as far as I know, um, as a non-resident, you're pretty much guaranteed that general season archery tag. I think a certain percentage of, of those tags have to go to non-residents, and I don't think enough non-residents actually put in for the tag so okay you you know for me i'm pretty sure i could hunt it every year so yeah oh wow is that that's an august hunt yeah it's an august hunt it's basically just you know they call it a general season hunt that you have to apply for so gotcha cool so let's uh let's talk a bit about what's uh most pressing on the calendar travis and that's spring bear you already kind of mentioned that you're gonna hopefully get out with the long bow um, I get, you're staying there in Idaho to hunt bear. Um, uh, yeah, I've I actually I drew a bear tag in Oregon this year too. So, oh, nice. Have you hunted bear out there before? I have not. So it's going to be a learning experience. I'm going to try and hopefully get over there and um get a good backpack hunt in, and hopefully, uh, you know capitalize on a big brewing but as far as idaho goes 
I was gonna, are you going over there with your longbow for that hunt? No, no, oh. I'm I'm not going to handicap myself that much. <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, man! <laughs> I'm you know I'm, I'm strictly man. over strictly over a bait for my longbow. So all right, yeah, yeah, that would be quite the task to get a spot and stock bear done with a longbow. That'd be impressive. Yeah, you know I I, I don't think it's. Uh, beyond reality i just think the the biggest thing with that is just opportunities between spot and stock bears are pretty slim yeah yeah what is i mean what if you're going specifically for spot and stock i mean obviously you want to be glassing and doing things like that but you know i guess to compare it to mule deer for example you know there's this sort of typical playbook of get high and then you know you want to glass and wait for the thermals. Hopefully the thermals rise in. You can make a play from up top. You know, that's kind of you, to make it all sound really simple. Um, what's common advice. What is that for bears? I mean, if you're going specifically for spot and stock, what's some of the game plan, some of the strategy and some of the tactics that go into that? You know, for me, um, just kind of the same as mule there, just getting up high, getting a good vantage point. And get into a spot where you can see a lot of country and, you know, just glass. <clears throat> you know, early in the year, you know, the snow line's good. It's greening up. Um, those bears are out there, you know, they're just, they're putting on some fat after that long winter of hibernation. So just keying in on those good green areas, I think, are really going to up your odds. Mm-hmm. It's playing the food source. Exactly. Yeah. So in Oregon, from the research that you've done, you know, the terrain um, sounds like it could be quite a bit different, especially as you head more west in Oregon. Um, is that something that you anticipate having to adapt to in, a, you know, more of a thicker forested area, or is that not the uh, terrain that you're headed into? No, the the terrain that I am headed to is a lot like Idaho, you know. It's basically just across the border there. And Okay, so you're staying more I'll on the eastern side. Yeah, I'll be hunting river country, so okay. it's going to be steep and rocky and, you know, hard to access, but, you know, that's what makes those kind of hunts fun. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. For sure. So back to the, the longbow and baiting, what is your, um, how do you run a bait site in terms of timing, in terms of, uh, you know, relation to the season and when you're going to hunt? You know, basically as soon as, I'm allowed to stick a bait out there. I'm out there and I'm going to put, I might put a couple baits out, but I usually just put one bait out in a good location and hope for the best. You know, I'll put a 55 gallon drum out there with dog food in it and donuts, whatever I can get my hands on. And, you know, as soon as that, that barrel gets hit, I'm hunting it. You know, I'm, I basically put my bait up. Um, you know, I try to be smart about setting it up where I, which direction I think the bears are going to come from and that kind of thing as far as playing the wind. But, you know, sitting in one spot in a ground blind or a tree stand, you know, you're pretty vulnerable anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How often do you check that site then? I mean, in terms of monitoring it for activity or refreshing the bait? Oh, you know, if it's close, I'll check every three days, but you know, once a week, something like that when time allows the first the first chance i get to go check it yeah uh, do you prefer a ground blind or tree stand um you know for a long bow i i, I just want to shoot one on the ground but okay you know if, as far as staying scent free and that kind of thing i think a tree stand's probably a a better call mm-hmm right you know, get your scent up off the ground and you can see that much better. And, you know, you don't have to worry about a sow and cub sneaking up on your backside. <laughs> I had a buddy once that told a story of like a sow and I think two or three cubs came in and literally the one of the cubs was trying to crawl in the blind. Uh, <laughs> they were just freaking out, you know, uh, I can't Jeez. imagine what that would be like. Yeah. So your your longbow setup, um, I mean, have you gone much into the specific arrow and broadhead? I mean, have you set that up for bears specifically, or you already kind of were shooting something that was sufficient for bears? You know, I, I've i got, um, you know, I shoot 125 grain 
steel force fat head broad heads it's just a you know a two blade that you know and i've got a oh i think it's a 50 grain brass insert up front so it's a little heavier up front but you know you're only shooting 20 yards and if you've got a good sharp broad head and you put it where it's supposed to go i think i think it's going to do its job so yeah that just made me think we're jumping back now but in terms of um your compound setup and then broadheads. I mean, obviously Idaho is a fixed blade state. When you go to other states, do you ever stray from a fixed blade and try a mechanical um, to maybe increase your range or anything like that when you're hunting mule deer? You stick with that one fixed blade setup? I just stick with the fixed blade setup. I just, you know, most all my hunting is done here in Idaho. And, you know, once you start messing with things mid season, you know, it just kind of flusters your confidence. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I try to just stick with the same setup. Yeah. So, what does your uh, setup look like for compound in terms of arrow and broadhead? I shoot um, a three forty axis Easton axis with a uh, hundred grain terminal T lock broadhead. Okay. You know it, it. Seems to be a pretty good combination. So. Yeah. I, you, I like those those trophy taker broadheads. They sure seem to shoot really well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Have you played with the shuttle tees at all, or are you just always stuck to the terminal? I shot the shuttle tees when they first came out, and when they first came out, they didn't seem to be very sharp for whatever yeah. reason. So I, I think they're good now. I've actually shot some since they've they're black now, and they just yeah, seem to they're like a the black better. ops edition or whatever. Yeah, they, the the edge is just a lot better. Yeah, I ran into that same thing with them, but I mean, you're right, the black ops, the newer ones are certainly much better so what the uh, poundage are you shooting on your hoyt there i'm shooting just a 70 pound bow um you know i i've always shot 80 but they had a 70 pounder in the bow shop and i didn't want to have to order one so mm-hmm. you know i went with that and it seems to shoot just fine so yeah <laughs> have you found that as bows have gotten faster and more efficient that you're less inclined to shoot 80 anyway, just in terms of not needing that extra force, or you just always want, you know, as much uh, kinetic kinetic energy as possible. That's what I was always looking for, you know, just that extra, you know, say you hit a bull in the shoulder blade or something like that. I, you, you just, you want that hope of, of punching through, you know, and I, up until this year, you know, I've always shot 80 pounds and, you know, I've, I've shot elk square in the shoulder blade and, and happen and have always punched through. So I, that's a system that I kind of believed in, you know, I shot a heavy arrow and a heavy bow and you know, it's, it's done wonders for me. Yeah. If it's working, don't screw it up. Right. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Travis, I mean, we're coming up on the season. We might have to uh, get you back on here talk about how your bear season goes. And then in the midst of preparing for mule deer, probably would love to chat more about that, but for now, where can uh, listeners follow you, whether that's the the new site with Skyline Hunting, what's that website, or some of the social media profiles, anything like that, where they can follow your season? You can uh, look us up on skylinehunting.com. We'll have, you know, as the season comes closer, we're going to try and keep a weekly blog and just add a lot of content and photos, along with, you know, our Facebook page, Skyline Hunting. Um, you know, I'm on Instagram and Facebook as well. So, okay. Do you know your Instagram handle offhand? Uh, uh yeah, it's just Travis underscore Nawatney. Okay, perfect. Yeah, definitely jump on there and take a look at all the animals Travis has been able to knock down the last few years. It's a pretty impressive list. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've we've shared some of them through the Hunt Pack Country uh, Instagram channel as well. Cause yeah. You just you have a ton of good content, man. A ton of good animals, and it's it's awesome to see you get it done. So, we'll be sure to follow you this season, and hopefully have you back on to chat more about uh, not only how your hunts are going, but how we can better prepare for our hunts. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for having me on here. It was a great chat. Thank you for listening to the Hunt Back Country podcast. 